So, um, welcome to our uh, monthly lunch and learn. Today's uh, topic is fostering our future. Um, first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about what is kinship care, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Amy Dreyer, the Associate Executive Director of the Adoption and Foster Family Coalition of New York, otherwise known as AFFCNY, because we have an acronym for everything in this world. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how the New York State Kinship Navigator supports families. Um, this is the fourth Lunch and Learn series uh, that we've done so far. They seem to be pretty effective, pretty popular. So if you've got any suggestions for future Lunch and Learns, um, please let us know. Otherwise, we will be in touch with what uh, our next Lunch and Learn is for June. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Everybody is on mute and will stay on mute for the duration of the webinar. It is being recorded, so we will distribute that to you after it's completed. If you have any questions during the uh, conversation, please feel free to chat, drop them in the chat box and we'll answer them as they're asked or at the end of our conversation. So thank you for joining us. You can see here um, the, the past lunch and learns that we've done. Sorry, Ryan, go ahead. Next slide. So first of all, I just wanna kick it off. My name is Ray Glazer. I'm the director of the New York State Kinship Navigator Program. Um, we are information referral and education. Ryan's gonna have a conversation a little bit about what the Kinship Navigator does and what services we offer later on in the conversation. I just wanna kick us off by talking a little bit about what is kinship care and what does kinship care look like in New York State. So kinship care is when non-parents, usually grandparents, other relatives, family, friends, known as fictive kin, uh, provide full-time care and control for children when the parents can't parent. Um, we see that most kin are maternal grandparents, and that is basic kinship math. We say usually when we see kids that are in kinship care, they um, start out with two parents for one reason or another. It goes down to usually mom caring for the child. If mom can't care for the child, her mom will step in and care for the children. So it's very common that we see maternal grandparents, but we do see aunts, uncles, cousins, adult siblings, um, and other relatives and family friends. So why do kids come into kinship care? Well, it's basically for the same reasons that they end up in foster care. Rarely a good reason. You see here below, abuse, neglect, parental substance abuse, mental health, incarceration, death. Lately, COVID-19 has been a factor. Um, military deployment. Um, it's not a good reason that they end up with kin, but we do tend to find that kids that, kids that are placed with kin, rather informally or formally, mm -hmm. tend to do better because they're in a very comfortable environment, a very familiar environment. They have higher stability, higher permanency rates. So what does kinship care look like in New York State? Um, about one in 11 kids will live in a kinship home at one point in their life, one in five black children. Um, in New York State, there's about 195,000 kids with relatives outside of foster care, um, roughly about 16,000 in foster care. Um, and of those 16,000, about 7,500 with a relative. Um, so it's important to note that most of the families that we see in New York State are what we call informal caregivers. They're caring for a child without the benefit of foster care resources. Um, but about 50% of caregivers have had contact with CPS at one point in time. Um, again, about half caregivers have had children in their home for five years or more, but kinship care runs the gamut. Sometimes it's for a couple of months, sometimes it's for 18 years. Um, next slide, Ryan. So what are the common caregiving concerns that we see when relatives take on children? First of all, financial stability. Um, as I said before, rarely are kids placed with relatives for a good reason, but it's also done very quickly. Um, so there's not a lot of time to catch your breath. Uh, you got a child in your care and you have to figure out how to send them to school, how to feed them, how to clothe them, maybe diapers, childcare is really expensive. Um, so we see caregivers coming to us wondering how they're gonna afford it. Um, they don't know how to enroll children into school. They may or may not have legal custody, which isn't necessary, but it, 
hurdle for them to know how to navigate that system. And they also want to know what their rights are, what type of legal permanency options do they have. About half of caregivers that come to us have no formal legal designation whatsoever. Um, so those are the big things that they come to us for. And also the kinship programs that provide boots on the ground services across the state. Um, so with that framework in mind, I want to turn it over to Amy Dreyer, who's going to talk a little bit about what AFFCNY can do for caregivers um, and also what services they provide and how to get in touch with them. Over to you, Amy. Hello. Um, as Ray said, thank you, Ray. I am Amy Dreyer. I'm the Associate Executive Director of Programs um, at the Adoptive and Foster Family Coalition of New York. And I guess first, for those of you who don't know us, um, our mission. So we are uniting foster, adoptive, and kinship families. Um, we like to work in collaboration, not only with parents, but with organizations, agencies, um, anyone who can work with us to help bring stability, well-being, and permanency to children. So, and we believe that no one should be alone or unsupported. So if someone at the coalition cannot support you, we're gonna find those tools or that other community organization that can. And, and that's our goal, like to leave no one without some kind of support or advocacy. And then we've got some general goals, education and support, um, improve services, increase involvement, um, educate not only parents, but leaders. So we offer trainings and information services for other organizations, agencies, departments, and in general, advocating for greater support of all of the parents out there throughout New York State. Um, and here's some specific programs. Um, something we're super proud of is our 24 seven helpline. Um, you can call the coalition anytime. Um, staff will answer. It's staff with lived experience. Um, because it's not a hotline, if you do get someone's voicemail, we will call you back or you can call us back. Um, so if you're having an issue, we will get you where you need to go again. Um, we have post adoption guardianship support, which is part of the uh, Permanency Resource Center network across the state. Uh, we have 19 counties so if you are uh, an adoptive or guardian family you can call you can get free support you get information you can get some case management um, there's free trainings so of course you can connect with them foster and kinship care support um, we do some problem solving um, generally figuring out who can support you you know, places like Kinship Navigator, who's hosting this today, have some super resources. So many times um, I'm forwarding those calls, forwarding that information there. Parent support groups, we have a ton around the state. We're supporting um, on our list over a hundred parent groups. So if you've got a parent group or you wanna start a parent group or connect with one, um, reach out. We'll get you connected and we'll get you support. Uh, conferences and trainings. Lots of stuff going on. Um, Kinship Navigator is gonna put a link for me on one of the slides. So um, when you receive this, you can click on that link, affcny.org, um, find out what's going on. We just had our annual conference and it was fabulous. We had um, some great people coming. We had Bruce Perry, who just uh, finished a book with Oprah Winfrey. We had Dan Hughes, we had the Carol, so some really, really fantastic stuff, and it's not too late to get in our network and see those. Um, our Adoption Foster Care Therapist Network, we have a list, a referral network and list that we connected on our website. So if you're looking for, for lack of a better word, vetted um, therapists, we have some people on our board and advisory board that really work with these people to find out um, how, how their services can help foster adoptive and, and kinship families. So you can get a list on our website, advocacy and policy. You know, we're always looking to support parents. So if you've got something um, that you're interested in 
getting involved in uh, legislatively at the federal level, at the state level. We work in coordination with Champs of New York, uh, national champs and other organizations. So talk to us about what you're hearing and, and join us. Let's see, information and resources. Kind of a repeat, we've, we've got the information. If you need it, come to us. Um, adoptive foster and kinship families. And if we can't help you, like I said, we will find the people that can. We will, you're never alone. Um, we're never just gonna say, sorry, we don't have that. We're gonna find what you need. Okay, here's a little bit about us. Um, we track the people that we're connecting with. So last year, so you know, I mean, and this, this isn't a finite list, but these were the top five attributes of so foster parents, kinship foster parents, adoptive parents, former foster parents, and relative um, or non-relative kin. In terms of former foster parents, that may seem odd, but sometimes foster parents are reaching out because they've heard a child has come into care, or perhaps they're a kin foster and they, they, you know, now they have a direct placement, something like that. So that's where that former comes in. In terms of issues, advocacy is always at the top, helping advocate for the needs of families around the state. Legal always comes in near the top as well, knowing your rights, uh, fair hearings, general kinship issues. I know that's a big umbrella, but there's a lot going on there. And then a DSS issue. So questions about um, working in coordination with a department, how to get a department to respond to a particular issue. So that's what that's all about. Okay, so here's where we can get into a little bit of the meat of what's going on. Here's what we're hearing from caregivers. A lot of questions and I'll, I have some notes over here I'm gonna slide over. So financial support, emotional support, legal resources, parent groups, and then general resources. So you can leave that up, Ryan, if you want to. Um, so first, I think, whoop, I lost my notes. Ryan is going to talk a little about some of these things. Too. If you have, you know, financial support in New York State available to you as a foster kinship or adoptive parent, there are several choices. There's the non-parent caregiver grant, um, for those of you who have custody or guardianship, um, there's foster care, there's kin gap, right? I'm not sure if you're gonna go into kin gap at all, but kin gap um, is a permanency option in New York State that is different than adoption. And kin gap is available to fictive um, and relative kin, and it's available after six months in foster care. If a child is in a kinship foster placement for six months, then kin gap can start to roll in or adoption. Um, so no, I would say know your choices and reach out to the appropriate people, either myself, someone at the Kinship Navigator, they can connect you so you know kind of what path to go on. That being said, um, there are booklets out there so you know what kind of resources you have. OCFS puts out two, um, a voice and a choice, and there's one more um, that kind of lays out your options. And you should know those before you make any choices. You know, if, if you're told, hey, you need to get custody, you've got this child in your care, really stop, take a pause, you want to be there for this child that you know is related to you you have a connection to if you're kin but know know what's out there and know what's available for you and make the right choice based on facts and what's right for this child and your family um in terms of legal resources know your rights you know you have a right i get a lot of calls that um ask if it's okay to have an attorney you can hire an attorney at any time um we've just developed a legal list on our web page um, we're starting to look at you know family court attorneys around the state we're asking if some of them can um give a discount or do pro bono we're trying to look at that for folks but really know 
that you have a choice and you can hire attorneys. Some of them will just do a consultation. So, so you do have a right. Um, and I recommend it if there's really an issue going on. And as a, on the flip side of that, the kinship foster parents always ask, you know, how does this differ from, you know, a general foster parent? It doesn't. You have the same rights as um, a non-kin foster parent. And I wanted to go over some of those rights. I don't always go over them, but uh, they're really important to know. So some of the rights that you have are to um, a, a manual summarizing the agent's, agency's policy and practices. You have the right to receive information regarding a foster child's health history, receive information regarding immunization and medical examination schedules and protocols and procedures, um, and also for emergency medical treatment. Receiving basic information regarding the child's behavior, um, known propensities, you know, relationships with families. This all brings together um, the well being of the child, you know, and what's best for the child. So, the more you know and the more you're able to help this child have the best experience with you, um, receive an invitation to service plan reviews. Um, receive the agency's permanency hearing report, a notice of permanency hearings. Many times I'm told that um, families are not invited to permanency hearings. I know things are different now because we're in a pandemic, so a lot of this is virtual, but you still have a right to be at a permanency hearing for the child, which, take, which happen approximately every six months. Um, family court is an open court in New York State. Like I said, I know it's different when it's virtual because you have to get an invitation and click through. But if you're not getting invited, whether you're non-kin or kin as a foster parent, you have a right to be there. So ask your caseworker, let them know that you know you have a right to be there. And, and listen, you're gonna learn things You and your voice may be heard. Some, ju some judges directly address uh, foster parents and kinship foster parents. So you should be there. Um, let me see. You also have a right to receive a notice and participate in meetings um, of committee on special education. So you're able to, you know, you have the children in your care, so you need to help make these educational decisions on behalf of the child in the special needs program. Let's see. Um, also, this is, something that a lot of people call up about after a child is in your home for 12 months intervention um, in a court proceeding where a child's custody is at issue and these are all things you can hire an attorney in new york like i said so you can have an attorney do these things on your behalf we have links on our website you could always email me you could always call someone on our staff but i know this is kind of a quick overview, but uh, it's really important. I guess the next thing would be to petition the court to terminate parental rights after a child is in care for 19 months or if DSS or ACS or an agency fails to file a petition within 90 days after having been ordered to do so. So that's a lot <laughs> to swallow, but generally it's, it's, it's holding accountability. And if things aren't happening in a timely manner, you do have standing and a right um, to file something. It's just have these things go, go to these lists and know your rights, print them out if you have to, make notes if you have to. Knowledge is power. Also speaking the same language um, as the folks you're say in court with or working with, it's good to know these things and not everybody does. Um, you have also have a right to receive notice and participate um, know when the permanency goal is changed or when the child has been freed for adoption. Some folks are not going to court or they're not communicating effectively with their caseworkers, so they don't know that. Um, I think it's important to open those lines of communication. Um, this, this is one of the things, and 
you know, we have family first now. So we know that kinship is a priority, but if a child has been in your home um, for an extended period of time, talk to your caseworker and, and work on how there can be a connection between the child's birth family and you as foster parents, especially if you have this, um, it's been a long-term placement. You know, there, there has to be a way to transition children, you know, safely um, and effectively from one home to another without kind of exacerbating the trauma that already exists. So I think as we look to these new directives and laws that have been happening, you know, it, it's really important to keep those lines of communication open, like knowing these things, but then knowing that there's also other things out there that affect this. Um, receiving a 10 day written advance notice of the agency's intent to remove a child from your home, except for eminent danger. So the child is removed from your home and it wasn't because of eminent danger or immediate danger, you have a right um, to ask for advance notice. So you can start working on getting um, an independent review, um, then perhaps a fair hearing. So that's another thing that you have a right to. So before something happens, like I said, if there was no immediate danger, um, you can open those discussions and figure out why and, and weigh in on what's best for these children. Um, so those are just some of the things that I think folks aren't aware that they have, you know, a right to do. Um, I don't think there's any questions. Okay. So another thing that's been coming up a lot now that we're in the spring, um, which a lot of folks don't talk about is resources for children in their care that have to do with college. It's that time of year again. And one of the things that is available for youth, especially youth who have been in care or perhaps in a kinship home, um, student status on their FAFSA can be changed from dependent to independent. There's a section called 480D7 of the Higher Education Act. So this status is called a dependency override. It's, it's granted for unusual circumstances. It's granted on a case by case. Um, but as these students perhaps are looking at colleges, looking for financial aid, um, this dependency override, you do not have to um, list a parent income or asset information. So, and there are some reasons that merit this. Some of them can be incarceration or institutionalization of both parents or one parent, um, physical, sexual, emotional, domestic, or mental abuse, abandonment, failure of parents to provide. So this might be a place where, um, or haven't communicated with youth or generally have not been taking care of them. Um, you can go online, you can check these out. I can certainly give a link, but this kind of affords the opportunity if the youth hasn't been in foster care or you're in a direct or indirect placement for um, college age youth who are living with kin to perhaps go to college if, they, if they're not able to. Is just something that somehow gets overlooked but out there for youth and i don't think a lot of youth take advantage of it um, but i have known some that have and it does get granted so don't don't ever think well it won't work for me it, no one's gonna you know it, it'll work you just have to go through the right steps another thing that's been coming up a lot recently is Medicaid, Medicaid for foster youth, guardianship, and adoptive children. You know, in some cases that can be up to age 26. There are pamphlets out there and information out there um, to that effect. So realize that that's just something that um, you can get. It's available to youth um, and you should, kind of follow down that path and make sure that your child has the appropriate 
you know, Medicaid or medical information. Um, for example, we have some parents who perhaps are adoptive parents, their children have been on their private insurance and they lose a job. They get worried, they call us and they're like, what are we supposed to do? Sometimes people aren't told that because that child was in foster care for even a small amount of time, that child is eligible for Medicaid. Even when you first adopt, you do have a choice to kind of have both, um, the private insurance with backup Medicaid um, or just Medicaid. So that's something to look into too, depending on your circumstances for what's going on. Um, in your world. So let me see, I'm going over my things. Um, another thing, people come to us to get connected to one, one another. Recently, we've started to host a parent leader group. We're connected, I think I said, to over 100 parent groups throughout the state. So the parent leader meetings have come together to get support from one another, but also to figure out, well, what are the people in my region want? What are these adoptive foster and kinship parents most need. So we've had, there's been about four meetings and this summer, the first step we're gonna take is getting OCFS leaders and hopefully ACS leaders to discuss current issues, gain guidance, look at current practice versus um, adherence to administrative directives and laws. Because we all know that there are these decisions made at the state and federal level on things like um, parenting and family first, but are they really happening at your local level? What's going on? Um, so the parent leaders are gonna get together with these folks from the state and from the city and ask them some questions and then bring them back to the parents in their region. So, um, and then what we hope to get out of that is we're, we have a parent gathering every month that is part training, part kind of um, a get to know you connection kind of thing. We've been bringing people in to chat with parents. Um, we've invited Kinship Navigator in the future. We're gonna have a legal panel, but we're gonna let the parent leaders issues drive those things. So if you have something in your region that gosh we really want to know more about um you know how to get connected to legal services in central new york we can make that happen and do a training for that that's what the parent gathering is about because we have so many pocketed services we kind of throw an umbrella over everything so if you're kinship adoptive or foster you're invited to come to these um and learn and connect with other parents because you're never alone. We find that so many people still think that they're alone out there um, and you're not, you're, you're never alone. We can always connect you with um, someone like you, um, someone ex having an experience similar to yours. So definitely reach out. Let's see. Do we? I don't think we have any questions. Anything anybody else wants to know? Um, let me go to my next. Great. I just lost video. Hold on one second. There it is. Sorry. <laughs> Do you want to flip the slide one forward? Great. Okay. So here are some more things that are happening. Um, just to give you an overview about what we do. Um, we have a dad squad, which is new. You know, generally, you're going to see a lot of moms, grandmas, different people um, that are female coming to these meetings. The dads don't always come. We get a smattering of dads. So some of the dads said, we really want a group where we can focus on us and talk about the things. Because some of the times, dads and moms have different ways that they look at things. Not always, but sometimes. So we've got a monthly dad squad going on, um, if anybody's interested. There's a couple of, um, there's a book read going on. We've been doing that every summer. So you can check that out. Um, 
I talked about our monthly parent gatherings. The de-escalation technique, that's something coming up soon. Um, that's a training on just what it says, de-escalation. So this just gives you an idea of all the pieces that we're touching on um, at the coalition. So hopefully there's something for everybody. I don't know. What do you think, Ryan? I think so, Amy, and we really appreciate you, you know, coming and talking uh, with our group today and telling us more about, you know, I think it's so important um, that that kinship caregivers specifically, you know, know, know who to call, know uh, who to contact us when it comes to foster care, because, you know, as Ray mentioned at the beginning, we are seeing a lot more kinship foster care happen in New York. Um, and so, you know, knowing what their rights are is just really, really important. And so, um, you know, we're glad to have a partner in you uh, with the Adopted and Foster Family Coalition. Um, but with that, Amy, we are at our time limit. So we are going to be closing. Just wanted to briefly mention information about the Kinship Navigator. Uh, many of you already know our resource. It is nysnavigator.org. I uh, hope you can reach out to us if you have any additional questions. I am going to throw up our uh, email addresses here. If anyone does have any questions, I know we didn't uh, get any in the chat or in the Q&A today. If you do have any questions or want to follow up with any uh, of, of, uh, of the issues that Amy talked about today, we'd be happy to uh, field those questions. Uh, as Ray mentioned at the beginning, we will be sending out this PowerPoint slide deck as well as a video. Uh, link as well. So uh, with that, I will pass it over to Ray to say goodbye. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And thank you so much, Amy, for co-presenting with us. We really appreciate it. Looking forward to seeing everybody back in June. Stay tuned for more details on what's coming next. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks thank everybody. You.